This week we begin looking at literature written after the Civil War, when during the time of the Reconstruction. <coughs> the post-war challenge was to reconstruct a United States of America that was faithful to the language and intent of the Constitution, but appropriative of new opportunities and knowledge. In the time leading up to the Civil War and during the Civil War, there was a struggle to determine power relationships between state and federal governments. We saw that when Lincoln retaliated when the states, the southern states, asserted their view that they had the right to secede from the Union, um, and Lincoln was determined to prevent that from happening because he felt that the federal government had the right to keep states from leaving the Union. <coughs> we also saw a struggle to define the nature and control of the economy, and there was an increase in immigration and emigration, and that increase led to tensions of more religious and cultural theories and practices, and the rise of scientific inquiry that challenged them. After the Civil War, although slavery had been abolished, the role of freed slaves in society had not yet been determined. Freeborn blacks, indigenous Americans, recent immigrants, women of all cultures fought for their civil and human rights. Women were particularly active and influential during this time. They out of necessity, had increased their independence and their vis visibility and activity in society during the Civil War, and they continued that activity during the Reconstruction. They organized themselves. They became more politically and financially savvy. They established hospitals, schools, and recreation centers um, for to care for the newly freed slaves and the fighting men and families they had left behind. They became accomplished speakers and writers, and as such, they recognized and articulated the similarities between their own status and that of African Americans. At the end of the war, they were not willing to return to the lives they had been forced to live under antebellum patriarchy. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Harper, which we were introduced to briefly in our last lecture, um, was an African-American abolitionist, suffragist, poet, public speaker, and writer. She had been born to free African-American parents in Baltimore, Maryland, and was raised by her aunt and uncle after her mother died at the age of three. She went to a school for um, black children that her uncle ran um, he founded and ran until she was about age 13, and then she found work as domestic help for a Quaker family. Um, <clears throat> she also worked as a teacher and then got into the public speaking and writing. She wrote, or she spoke, at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention in May of 1866, and she said, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity, and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. This grand and glorious revolution, which has commenced, will fail to reach its climax of success until throughout the length and breadth of the American Republic the nation shall be so colorblind as to know no man by the color of his skin or the curl of his hair. It will then have no privileged class, trampling upon and outraging the underprivileged classes, but will be then one great privileged nation whose privilege will be to produce the loftiest manhood and womanhood that humanity can attain. I find it interesting that she mentions being colorblind as an asset. Um, I know that what she's getting at is that people won't be judged because of their color, or they won't have assumptions made about them because of their color, or they won't have doors opened or closed because of their color. Um, but in you know conversations about race 
and skin color today, we are recognizing that color blindness is not really the way people want to live because people's skin color says much about their ethnicity, about their heritage, about their culture, about where they're from. It's part of who they are. And to say that one is colorblind is to say that an important aspect of one, a person's identity just doesn't matter. But at this time, of course, Harper was trying to get people to recognize that skin color wasn't an indicator of a person's worth or intelligence or abilities <clears throat> or whether or not they should be part of a so-called privileged class or an underprivileged class. Her argument is a noble one. However, while many women and African Americans and others um, working to rebuild society were supportive of her comments, of her argument, it was not a majority opinion. And that was because Harper's argument for a shared community of interests and a classless society directly conflicted with the rugged individualism required for imperialist expansion. And this was a time when the nation was being rebuilt, and as part of that rebuilding, there was a focus on expanding outward, expanding to the West, about um, seeking new and better and more opportunities. And in order to do those things, you had to have people who were um, individuals, people who were out for themselves, so to speak. So this noble argument was not the majority opinion. And from that expansion, we saw a change in population, uh, trends toward urbanization as well as westward, westward expansion. One of the major reasons why this was taking place was that in 1869, the first transcontinental railroad was completed. Um, it had been built by exploited African Americans, Asians, and other poor and marginalized people. It was followed by, I think, three other transcontinental railroads, as well as several canals. I think the Erie Canal, the St. Lawrence Seaway, those things that had been opened up during those times as well. And together, they opened up the frontier. They made distribution of raw materials, agricultural products, and manufactured goods easier than ever before. They ushered in a transformation from small towns and rural communities to urban centers. In 1850, New York City had a population of about 500,000 residents. By 1900, just 50, 50 years later, that population had gone to, grown to three and a half million. Chicago also experienced a large um, exponential increase in population from 20,000 in, in 1850 to about 2 million by 1900. <clears throat> the Transcontinental Railroad and the system of canals facilitated greater class and cultural interaction and assimilation. So as people expanded out west, you know, many people from different backgrounds, different classes and cultural backgrounds um, were part of this westward expansion, as well as the increase in diversity in the urban centers. Um, there was more interaction between people who would not have interacted before. And that was a good thing that helped develop that um, diverse national character. However, at the same time, it also destroyed Native American cultures and lands. Um, it created this pressure to conform, which we commonly call the melting pot. Um, it's important to note, though, that only white cultures were invited to full participation in the melting pot. African Americans, Asians, and Native Americans were invited, but only as servants. In 
In March 1867, the Republican-dominated Congress passed the Reconstruction Act. This act struck down many restrictive codes that targeted blacks. It established the Freedmen's Bureau to protect rights and lives of blacks in the South. As part of the Freedmen's Bureau, Bureau many Northerners, um, those who were free blacks, those who were um, abolitionists, whites working towards abolition and reconstruction, many women were involved in this, um, and many other people who were just involved with the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, runaway fugitive slaves, escaped slaves, former slaves now, but they were all traveled back to the South to set up schools, establish cooperatives, and train the newly freed slaves in the rituals and responsibilities of citizenship. As part of the schools that they established um, in the years 1866 to 1868, the Freedmen's Bureau, along with churches and visionary philanthropists, established what we now know as several of the historically black colleges and universities, Fisk, Morehouse, Howard, Atlanta, Talladega, and Hampton were all established during this time. So there was a lot of positive change that was taking place in society during this decade of Reconstruction, and three important pieces of legislation other than the Reconstruction Act were passed during this time. In 1865, the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution abolished slavery except as a punishment for crime. Um, that's how we have prisons. Um, in 1868, the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution ensured that African Americans were citizens of the United States and as such um, provided for their equal protection under the law. And in 1870, the 15th, 15th Amendment to the Constitution gave the right to vote to all African American males. So every citizen had the right to vote, and at the time, males could be citizens and could vote. So this amendment made sure that all males who were old enough were citizens could vote. Um, because of the 15th Amendment in particular, blacks started to experience a rise in political power. Enough so that in Louisiana, African American voters were able to bring about the election of a black governor. And 16 African Americans represented their districts in the U.S. Congress. And African Americans significantly influenced several state legislatures. However, in many places in the South, they were still marginalized. They never actually obtained the right to vote. The local governments managed to make it impossible. Um, neither the three amendments nor other reform legislation was uniformly enforced or even recognized. Eventually, after this decade of Reconstruction, things began to take a turn. In 1877, the federal troops withdrew from the South. Uh, that ushered in this period that I like to call the Deconstruction. Um, the Deconstruction was characterized by the reversal of protective legislation by state and federal courts. There was a return to the power of there was a return to power of Democrats in the South, and that um, came with a reversal of limited economic and social gains that African Americans had experienced immediately after the Civil War. This return to power of the Democrats in the South also fostered the rise of white supremacist terrorist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, which I will remind you is still in operation. And it embarked, the, the KKK embarked on a campaign of brutal suppression that the federal government did little to stop. So we had this period 
of promise, this period of rebuilding and making the nation into one that valued diversity, that recognized the rights of all citizens, and that was truly a land of opportunity for all. But as politics generally does, it started to mess things up. And so uh, things started to take a turn backwards. And we are going to see how this period of Reconstruction um, influenced or spurred much of the literature of that time as we read for the next couple of weeks.